It was one of my jobs as a martial arts instructor to be a more dangerous person than I am really. What's up, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 510, with today's guest, Ms. Shirley Meyer. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm your host here for the show. I'm the founder at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know more about what that means, go to whistlekick.com. That's where you'll find out everything we're doing. And one of the things you'll find over there is our store. And if you use the code PODCAST15, you can save 15% off every single thing that we sell. Martial Arts Radio, this show gets its very own website at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We release two brand new episodes every week, and the goal of this show is to connect, educate, and entertain the traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do, you can do a number of things. You can make a purchase, share an episode, follow us on social media, tell a friend, pick up one of our books, leave a review somewhere, or support our Patreon. Patreon.com slash whistlekick, that's the place to go. If you support us for as little as $2 a month, you're going to get access to more content. And depending on the tier that you support us with, you'll get more stuff. The more you contribute, the more we're going to give you. Seems like a pretty good trade-off, doesn't it? Check it out. Patreon.com slash Whistlekick. Today's guest has connections to a past guest. And she's an author. She's a martial artist. She's an instructor. She's a student. And we have some great conversation. We go all over the place on this one, as you might expect. Kind of a hallmark here for this show. And that's a good thing, because it gives us the opportunity to talk about things that you might not expect us to talk about. I had a great time talking with her, and I hope you have as great of a time listening. So here we go. Ms. Meyer, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, how you doing? I'm great. How are you? Uh, pretty good, actually, aside from uh, some allostatic pressure from the coronavirus here. Mm. Yeah. Do you notice everyone on the planet seems to be, if they are self-isolating, seems to be having um, mental issues and reactions? Yeah. That's from, that's from this, the, pan, the, the fight or flight pressure. Mm. Really, it's funny you bring that up, and and I totally agree. I was talking with a friend yesterday, mm-hmm. uh, and this is a friend that I do I do some work for. I do some consulting work on, outside of Whistlekick, and oh yes, we were we were hanging out, we were doing some stuff yesterday, and it was two o'clock rolls around, and she comes into comes into where I have my desk at her office, and she says, you know, I'm fried. I got to go home, yep. and I said, you know, I feel I'm feeling the same thing. Yep. You know, I I've been at about seventy to eighty yep. percent on good days. And it's really weird. It's uh, most people don't realize that they are under that amount of pressure. I'm just staying home. No, you're not. This is this is uh, an intense uh, fight or flight kind of thing. And uh, if you're in training, you realize, oh, the reason the reason you uh, you feel so tired in your class is probably because you have been obsessing in the back of your head. Am I going to do it right next time? Hmm. You're literally putting pressure on yourself when you're not in class. Makes sense. Which is, which is kind of interesting. Makes sense. It uh, sounds like you spend time thinking about this stuff. A, a little bit. A little <laughs> bit. The last class I had uh, in martial arts was teaching grades uh, three and four. I was an itinerant karate teacher for Montessori schools. And I bet uh, there aren't too many people that can put that on their resume. No. Um, that's but really you cool. see, it's uh, it's it's uh, I I had a couple of little tricks. I mean, uh, when you're trying to keep grade three boys and grade four girls, you know the, and and then you have the little ones who are, you know, oh, they're in grade one. It's like, oh boy, okay, let's all play duck duck goose, um, because the trick that I had, um was I would uh, promise the boys one gross fact about karate uh, at the end of, a, of an hour's good attention. Hmm. Yeah. And did that work? Oh, yeah. They, a different yeah. motivator than I've heard of before, but it makes sense. Yeah, well, the thing is, they, uh, they loved it. They gave me careful attention because they wanted to see what next gross thing I would come up with, you know. And the problem is they went home and told their parents, and their parents were grossed out, so... They didn't like it. But the parents weren't your audience. 
Nope, they were not. So tough. They were not. Oh, I got told for that class. Oh, what is this rodeo you've got going on? Uh, it's um, it's just teach them push-ups. Just teach them sit-ups. Excuse me, that's not martial arts. That's calisthenics. The uh, fellow who hired me did not understand what I was really doing. He was, he, he was upset by the fact that I was teaching these little kids real self-defense. Um, so, uh, I would teach, you know, one of the gross facts is, uh, uh, why the punch twists on contact, you know, and it's, um, it's basically to break skin. So the boys thought that was wonderful. Ew, ew, ew. They fled, they fled my class. They grabbed their bags and fled screaming. Ew, ew, ew. And we're back for next week. So that was and that's probably the only demographic where you can, you can deem that response successful. Oh yeah. I think if, I think any other age group, I think any other, you know, grouping of people, if they left your class running away, screaming, ew, they probably wouldn't come back. Yeah, but you see, this is the kids, and they they were bored by, you know, safe adults. It was one of my jobs as a martial arts instructor to be a more dangerous person than I am really, you know. But um, I, had to, uh, I, I had to appear uh, in an entirely different way to get their attention to, to continue their interest in the martial art, you see. Um, I used to do a class, um, uh, nothing focuses grade threes and fours and fives, even all the way up to, you know, early high school, as much as when you walk into a classroom with a golf bag full of swords. Ooh. Yeah. Cause you I, see, I, I used to, I picked this up from my friend TJ, um, who did the talk my uh, T Teal James Glenn, he's a uh, stunt uh, sword, yeah. sword master. Yeah, he's, been, he's been on the show. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he spoke at my, um, where I got my black belt. Um, so anyway, he used to do this wonderful segment about how Shakespeare had to get it right. And when you walk into an English class of grade fives, you know, and you have, um, the, the sword bag, and you basically talk about, you start by talking about um, the opening fight scene in Romeo and Juliet. You know, everyone thinks, ew, Romeo and Juliet, you know, boys and girls and romance and blah. You start with the fight scene, and all of a sudden you have everybody's attention. And that's pretty much why Shakespeare wrote it that way. Because the, the sword fight was the... Um, medieval, early Renaissance equivalent of um, of a movie opening with a car chase. Mm. You see, that's fascinating. It, it's so easy to forget that Shakespeare wrote plays, not books. You know, most of us have consumed far more Shakespeare by reading it than by watching it, which is unfortunate because it's a whole different experience. But that makes so much sense. Yeah, yeah how many well, movies today open with a car chase to? To pull uh, explosions, us in. Uh, whatever. Mm. I mean, you got to remember in the Globe, the Globe Theater um, was in A, a rough part of town, and B, um, uh, on one end of the street, you had bear baiting, some, some guy setting, um, setting dogs on bears. On the other end of the street, you had the Swordmaster School, and every Friday or every whenever they did. Um, the prize fights, which are when the journeymen fought the masters to get their mastery in sword. And, uh, and then you have the poor old globe sitting in the middle, having to draw audience somehow. So of course you're going to start with a sword fight. The other interesting thing you've got to remember is that when Shakespeare was writing, uh, a lot of guys in the pit, you know, the, the, the pit where they paid a penny to stand under the stage and, and boo and throw peanuts. Um, mm. Those guys were um, mostly off the field, the battlefields of France, right? They had just come through the hundred years war. 
the War of the Roses, all of this stuff. If the playwright wrote it wrong, these guys were inclined to climb up on the stage and show these namby-pamby actors how it was really done. <laughs> so you had to get it right. In that sense, Shakespeare was a martial artist. I think that's the first time I've ever heard that claim made. But <laughs> I, I mean, don't know that I can easily refute it. I mean, it might, it might not fit a lot of people's definition of martial arts, but we're not as far off as, as I think I would have initially yeah. imagined. That's, well, I like it. He had to get it right. Uh, sure. The, in that particular fight scene, it's very simple because Shakespeare wrote it around real sword terms, the real masters of sword. Uh, they're, when Mercutio and Romeo are insulting each other, they're insulting each other's sword fighting style. And mm -hmm. Shakespeare got it right. He had to, J just to just to keep his poor his poor mm -hmm. actors safe. And he was an occasional actor too, so you know, he didn't he didn't want to get confronted with some with some guy from the fields the muddy fields of France with a with a real small sword in his hand. And they did use real small swords, court swords, on stage. It wasn't mm -hmm. you know baited or fake usually. Because uh, people were close enough to the stage to tell if it right. was fake, right? So, so uh, a lot of the I, I contend that a lot of the actors, especially in some of the more raucous plays, were um, were not like sword masters, stage masters, stage combat masters today. Um, I mean, uh, they were they were just figuring out how to make it so that they could present this on stage realistically without killing each other right no i i'm with you yeah now, your 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 explanations here seem a little bit more than just a coming from a, more than a cursory understanding of of stage and stage combat um i i worked i did uh, i did some stage combat with tj uh okay. yeah he 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 flung me around uh i was one of his uh, stunt crew for a really awful little movie that we did down in Baton Rouge. I yeah. think it's the world's, I, I've had friends, it's given me my, IM, my only IMDB credit, but it has given cause for my friends who watch bad movies to call me up and apologize for having watched it. <laughs> so I will not tell you what uh, what what the the movie name it, it was. Oh, well, we're, we're going to have to link to that because anytime someone claims that the worst movie of all time exists and they were in it. Okay. I mean, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty. And, and you know, you don't have to, I mean, we, you know, we can, we can make this sort no, of an no, Easter egg no. thing, but yeah, but that's, you see, it's the, uh, it's called journey to Promethea. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was uh, an open, open casting call for costumers, like for anyone uh, in the Ren the Renaissance fair in Baton Rouge. Uh, that way, they didn't have to hire anyone with costumes except for um, their main actors. The the crowd scenes were all open call to the local SCA and Ren Fair crowd. It it um, has a, a a score of two point four out of ten on Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> you just looked it up, did you? Or I'm sorry, on IMDb, of course. Yes, of, of course. course. I've got my phone handy. You you never yeah. know what kind of great stuff is going to come up. Yeah, you, I have um, one of these conversations. Yeah, it's uh, it was the the it's as original as dirt. Um, uh, and uh, and and uh, I'll have to say, we did we shot a um a mud fight in uh, a sword fight in a bayou, which is um th this huge mud fight. And it never got on screen. It was never part mm. of the, the movie. It was, well, which was too bad because that was a lot of fun. I got to run around in a, in a very, very badly fitting set of armor with the pot helm coming down over my eyes because only one of these helms had a liner. Everyone else stuffed bubble wrap in up underneath. And, um, and uh, I got to run around this uh, this muddy, muddy, mucky bayou in my own riding boots because I wasn't going to have my feet cut to ribbons by the the uh, sandals they gave us. Uh, sandals on a battlefield, not unless mm. you're Roman. OK, no, anyway, make... uh, with, with a flaming torch and screaming and, you know, it was a lot of fun. And then I got to be one of the dead bodies on the field and none of this made it into this movie. 
Well, that's a shame. Yeah. Oh, I did get my animal handling for this because everyone was too scared to touch the chicken. <laughs> um, yeah, they did. They, they, they this chicken must have been on ludes. I had to first of all. I'm standing next to the cameraman with this chicken dangling by its feet, and you know when you do that to a chicken, they just kind of hang there. They go into it like a trance. And uh, I would have to flip it up, shake it to wake it up, and then hurl it in front of the camera to make it look like it was actually um, capable of outrunning our lead actor, which was kind of funny. I, I, I think, I don't know that we've referenced chickens on the show. Here, here we are, you know, we're past 500 episodes. And anytime we talk about a new subject, uh-huh. uh, it, it, it tends to spark my my memory because I don't, I don't think we've talked about chickens. Oh, cool. And this is, um, it sounds like this film was far more fun to shoot than to watch. It was hysterical. It was, uh, uh, it was a blast. I was, uh, uh, at that time, uh, my current training, I had gone from, I was, I had been teaching women, children and differently able people, uh, self-defense for years. Uh, up mostly north of Toronto in uh, in the Muskoka area um, for uh, s- sale, which was sexual assault intervention for living. We, I, uh, my partner and I at the time, we were teaching up there. And then I had learned um, shiatsu, which was the next step in my training. In our style, um, uh, I've never formally gotten second and third Dan, but in our style, uh, third Dan is when you learn a, a healing art and bring it back into the martial art. Mm. So I picked Shiatsu, which is, uh, so I was the Shiatsu massage therapist on set. Um, we had a little person playing the wizard, uh, and, uh, that poor guy needed so much massage. It wasn't funny. Um, he did. He he uh, he really tipped me well because I treated him like a grown man, which he was, instead mm-hmm. of a child. And a lot of massage therapists, you know, just tapped on him because they were afraid of hurting him. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, he was a grown man, so he needed he needed really deep tissue massage. Is what he needed. We've started kind of going into the martial arts stuff. So let's, let's go back to that. And let me, let me ask you what I think is the, the first question I've really asked you yet today, which is how did you get started in martial arts? Uh, I was working with a, uh, another writer, um, my first collaborator. He, he and I worked in 80, 84 is when we sold our first novel. And uh, Steve found a karate club. And because we were sitting so much on our behinds writing, uh, we started we we started martial arts because a I'd have been the size and shape of the Pope's seat cushions if I didn't work out because I sat so much, and b if I was going to be writing about people pounding on each other in the books, I had to know sort of what I was talking about. So. I started karate at uh, York University, and uh, that was because uh, Steve, uh, it was Steve's old school, and we could get in without, this is a very unusual um, uh, karate club, because they, uh, the, the instructors, nobody, none of the instructors ever accepted payment for teaching karate proper. Getting paid for self-defense is different, but teaching people karate I do for free like the other black belts in the style so uh, that's where we started that's where I started and uh, it was it was an interesting uh, journey through the the various belts because it was in that school that I realized the majority of martial arts are set up to break down and rebuild the ego of your average teenage boy um, because I was the first woman to make it through two higher belts and get my black belt in this style. So I was kind of a pioneer there. I taught my teachers quite a bit, um, because 
uh, your average karate class, first of all, you are more likely to go through a martial arts class if you go with someone else. You, you, you pair up with somebody and, you, and uh, you're, you're less likely to drop out of the class if you go with someone else. And secondly, 90% of the dropouts, the, the boys that dropped out, and they were boys, they dropped out when they hit our senior green or early brown belt, because that's the point where we stopped uh, being, being the uh, ego, ego-driven let me ram my forehead into this brick wall kind of thing, which is what green belt training really is. Uh, as a brown belt in our style, uh, you, you, you stop for a minute and you look around and say, there's got to be a door here somewhere. You see, it's where you go from strength to soft, how to do soft strikes, how to quarter, how to get out of the way of an attack rather than, trying to stand toe to toe with somebody and beat them over the head with a concrete block, you know, which is really the, the start of most martial arts because it's an easy way to connect with, um, with how to do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. You see, uh, uh, if, if I were teaching, it's funny, the women, once they hit Brown belt, the women, perked up and said, oh, I know this, I recognize this, because the girls are taught to give way, and the boys are taught to be extremely aggressive. So if the women get through the really aggressive stuff, and, you know, they, they learn how to let the inner mad woman out uh, under control, then the minute they step into brown belt, it's sort of like, Oh, thank God. I know this. I understand this. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's, I haven't yet really figured out how I would turn traditional martial arts training on its head for the women. Hmm. But I think it would be a really effective class for, uh, women, kids, and d- differently abled people if, they started them with brown belt and then trained them all the other, the other direction. If you know what I mean. The, the, you're, you're speaking more to starting people with a less of a uh, concrete block approach. Exactly. But for most people in our society, strength is what they are most used to using. It's not judo, it's godo. And as I've been getting older, I've been finding, thank God, I learned years ago how to block with two fingers because uh, bone bruises on my on my forearms are not something I want to look for. Mm-hmm. Which um, the difference in blocking, just just with timing as opposed to brute force, right? This actually leads me straight into the martial art that I'm in now, which is actually horseback riding. And uh, I am having words with my teacher's horse, uh, Chloe, lovely Morgan horse, beautiful. Um, She does not like the thwip of arrows going past her ears. She might be a better cavalry horse than than mounted archery horse, but we'll Mm -hmm. see. Uh, Right now, I am focused really hard on the horseback riding comes first, the archery comes later, right? Because you have to have a really solid connection with your horse before you do crazy fish on their backs. Excuse my language, but (laughs) so the people I ride with, um, Peter, he is training with cavalry sword. Um, My uh, my buddy Bruce, he is training with lance. He's he's training using um, the same uh, targets that what was it Teddy Roosevelt developed. Because um, most lance target lancer targets before this were just hung from branches or hung from rafters, and um, Roosevelt basically said, uh, "No, if you hit a guy with a lance, he's not going to fly up and away from you. He's going to fall down." 
and the horse gets used to this in the first time that you hit a target on the ground and it falls down, the horse freaks out. So he came up with a modern target, which is your basic box with a weight in the bottom tied to the hay bale. So if you if your lance hits the ba uh, the the burlap bag stuffed with hay, uh, it gets hit and falls back, and then the weight pulls it upright again, so you can go around and do it again. Um, so that's what Bruce is doing, and I am I am making uh, hay bales very nervous. <laughs> We've had a number of folks on the show who are training in some manner of historical European martial art, you know, mm -hmm. some, some Hema stuff, some long sword. Stuff, yeah. um, mm -hmm. I don't know that we've had anybody on. The, I feel like we've had one person on the show who's done some Zen archery stuff. Mm -hmm. This is a, a, another first, the first time I've heard someone talk about using a lance, especially a mounted lance mm -hmm. in the context of martial arts. So before we go there, because I think this is, and, and this question is going to sound judgmental and it is absolutely not anybody who knows my history knows i don't mean this this way what is your definition yeah. of martial arts if i may um yeah sure no it's not it's not it's, um it's an excellent question um uh anything martial which is uh human on human conflict okay. and the art part is training to do maximum damage if you want or minimum damage if you want mm. it's it's training for control in human and human con conflict okay and i i think absolutely and everyone defines it differently but i mm -hmm. and I, I very rarely ask that in fact i may not have ever asked anyone that question outside of we've done some kind of debate roundtable sort of shows when we've talked about that subject but i mm -hmm. ask now because it it sounds like it's going to give us some insight into you and how you moved from from what sounded to be a traditional Asian martial art mm -hmm. to something like this that not not very common. Okay, it's uh, it, it is not very common. Um, it is I'm training with uh, people who are. Um, uh, they are. They were actually in the uh, Governor General's Horse Guard, so uh, they were doing. Um, first of all, they do the ceremonial stuff um, with the full Victorian uniform, right? Mm. Um, the the red coats and the and the brass hats, shall we say, the lancers. And uh, um, they also did um, World War One cavalry recreations you mm. see and uh, my teacher also she hosts the uh, and teaches the um the 19th um dragoons the light dragoons and uh and uh, toronto police horses train out at her place so it's more about horse and less about about eastern or western Let's just put it this way. B Bruce with a lance could just as easily recreate um, Alexander the Great's um, uh, steloi um, or, or companions uh, as he could recreate, um, you know, Victoria, Victorian lancers in the British Army. Um, the weapon... A form, form follows function basically, and if I'm using a uh, a an archery that is uh, if I'm I'm using a kid's light compound bow to practice with because I promised my teacher I wouldn't pull my war bow out because it's a 42 pound bear, mm. uh, and I and if I miss I didn't want to shoot out her uh, her her arena windows, um, but um. I'm looking at traditionally ancient Sarmatian Mongol um, steppe horse nomad combat. This led from a heck of a lot of research I did for a book a couple of years, like ten years ago, um, and I and I uh, 
when I was a kid, I used to faff around with horses and, uh, you know, uh, ponies on a string kind of thing. And um, my buddy Bruce, who, uh, who I got to know about, you know, maybe about 10 years ago, um, he, uh, he has his own horse, Oakley. And like I said, was doing the World War I recreations in the horse guard. Um, as a quick aside, uh, Bruce was part of the escort to bring Earth from Vimy, Br Vimy Ridge back to a cenotaph here in, um, in, uh, in Barrie, uh, which is north of Toronto, uh, for the 100th anniversary, right? Hmm. So he, was, he and his horse were in full World War I kit when they, when they escorted the grave, grave soil from, from Vimy and Yeap back home. So, um, if, if I go along this route, we're, we're starting to talk about the difference between, uh, warriors and soldiers. Yes. Let's do that. Because you see, I'm, I was married to, a um, a gentleman who, um, who, uh, used to fix buffs, um, uh, for the first Gulf war, he was on Guam and uh the u.s military or, or um, uh, air force basically taught him the difference between being a soldier and being a warrior because um that person now f uh has been fighting in the sca doing medieval recreation for years and the difference between soldier a soldier just does what they're told trusting the chain of command a warrior makes their own decisions. Is this cause, is this, is this worth fighting over? Is this worth going to hell for? Because in my definition, we're talking human and human conflict, and that goes straight into what I teach self-defense. If someone is willing to fight you, they are in hell. If someone is in a mental state where they are willing to fight another human being, I consider them in being in hell and my duty as a martial artist is to get them out of hell as fast as possible and if that requires some physical pain okay i can do it but it's i am fighting with compassion as opposed to easier emotions like rage i mean it's it's out of Oh God, I'm so sorry for you. Mm -hmm. Let me get you out of there. <laughs> you know, you don't want to fight. You really don't want to fight. Um, a soldier uh, can easily fight with all of the concrete block emotions, the the rage, the uh, the anxiety, the fear, the all of that stuff. That's all green belt stuff. When you get to training warriors. They have to learn to weigh the risks of, are you willing to go to a place where you're fighting? Are you willing to put yourself through that? Uh, or are you able to fight out of compassion and other emotions instead of, you bastard, bam, you know? Um, one is simple, one is very complex. Absolutely. And human beings, um, uh, human beings can easily be locked into the easy, the easy stuff. You know, sure. um, easy is easy. I mean, it doesn't require <laughs> yeah. as much effort. Yeah, that's right. You know, uh, uh, get mad. <laughs> that's there. Pretty straightforward. Problem solved. Yeah. Right. Um, now, the interesting thing, having learned shiatsu and uh which is pressure point massage right taking it back into the martial art means that to be honest uh if i use the points i i learned to heal with i mean i worked at um in in uh northern spas for quite a few years um and um oh i i caught a couple of interesting things a, a woman who was on the verge of liver failure and and my teacher and i managed to managed to catch it and arrest the the disintegration of her life, basically. Um, 
But if I took some of those spots, those things like, oh, gee, you're hurting here constantly. If I actually hit with intent on one of those points, I'm getting close to, you know, some pretty dangerous acupuncture. <laughs> and I'm using my thumbs instead of, you know. Um, um, it's all a matter of focus and intent. You see. Um, most of the easy emotions, uh, you're, you're, you, you, you can fling your fist out and you're, and you're using the entire surface of the, the two knuckles in that to, to spread your intent <laughs> to the other person, right? If I can take my intent, which is to stop you from being where you are, mentally, emotionally, however, if I, as a, as an instructor or as a, um, you know, somebody who has been, who has, who has gotten into an unfortunate situation because they're with somebody willing to fight you. Um, if I hit with intent to stop them, then I am doing so out of, out of, um, greatest compassion. Um, God, I'm so sorry. I have to hurt you, but you'll feel better afterwards, you know, that kind of thing. Where, and where does this come from for you? Because this is not, we have, we have heard from hundreds of people. We've talked to people who are all over the spectrum on how they feel about the need to defend themselves and the appropriate level of force and the emotion that goes with it mm -hmm. during that moment. Yes. We've heard from plenty of people who will advocate for minimal use of force to extract themselves from the situation. And but, run. That's, and run. that's sure, the sure. Sim simplest thing. But nobody, very few people are talking about having compassion for their attacker. This, this reminds me, and, and I am, um, you know, my experience with Buddhism is very limited, but this sounds almost like a, like a, a Buddhist philosophy. Well, it sort of is. Um, it's, it's something that I've, developed pretty much on my own as far as I can tell. Um, you know, if you're playing, uh, if you're, if you're, you know, doing Tai Chi and you're doing soft hands and, and light and um, my Shiatsu instructor who is in it for the healing, right? Is definitely, it, it, it was really funny, bald little Buddhist guy who, if he grins at you, you're going to fall down. You're going to fall down, you know. Um, I was studying with a, um, uh, a a gentleman who learned capoeira. And I had learned a very straight line, very hard line karate style. And whenever sensei would pull us out of the class and he'd say, okay, what I'm trying to show you is this. And he'd get us to to throw our best punches and kicks at him just standing there very much like um, um, the Aikido master uh, you learn who, who learns how not to be moved. If he intends not to be moved, he will not be moved. Um, and here we are, karate, karate student throwing her best punch, a capoeira student throwing his best flying kick, and both of us bounce. Because my sensei's instruction uh, is, is we bounced off his intent. He, he moved like a couple of, like, a, like an inch and a half kind of thing. But it was like trying to punch a spinning rubber ball. There was, there was nothing for us to grab onto. No negative emotion, no anger, no rage, no, no involvement. We were not, we, we were not able to catch him in our fight, our intent to fight. Um, he showed us that if you can take your, your ego out of it, and it's not about winning a fight, it's not about uh, ego and all of that stuff tangles you in your attacker's problems. 
if you can detach yourself from the whole thing, then they're less likely to be able to hurt you at all. Uh, if if they're if they're an idiot who raises bruises on you, fine. But they're not somebody who damaged you spiritually. You see? Yeah. And uh, and that's why it's all intent and focus. You can literally take as long as you are detached from the 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 situation. You don't have to take it personally into yourself. You don't have to absorb it and take the beating the emotional beating of it which actually i find is far more destructive and so you know i'm teaching these little boys in grade three and grade four you know first of all if i ever hear you taking any of what i'm teaching you out onto the playground you're out of my class because little boys on playgrounds little girls on playgrounds they, they fight with ego and they're fighting to win and they're fighting to be top dog, boss, whatever. They're fighting because they don't want to feel diminished. And in a lot of cases, a lot of attackers fight because they, do, they, they, they don't want to feel diminished or disrespected or they, they feel made lesser. And I am not inclined to get into many fights because I don't tend to want to put people down. It's, if you're playing, if you're playing the way most human beings are taught currently on this planet, you're, uh, you're talking about uh, a hierarchical struggle. You're talking about uh, um, a, a dominance thing. And I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not into dominance games. You, you want to, you want to feel, feel great i'll lift you up not a problem i'll praise you all you need to i'm not i'm not here to run you down it's not my job and as a martial arts instructor it's my job to teach people to not let themselves get beat up emotionally as well as physically and the interesting thing that's what the horse is teaching me if you go in to try and ride a horse with a with bad intent you'll get dumped on your ass so fast you might get bitten you might get kicked you have to actually be on your the same on on your horse's side on the person's side you know just just be with them and then if things really go south and they don't want to be with you anymore then then you can you you have you have the capacity to step back and say, this is not my problem. And no matter how hard you try, you can't make it my problem. I will not hurt for you. Um, this is fascinating. And, and I, I hope you'll continue. And I've, okay, I know well, I've, I know I've been pretty quiet, but that's because you're, you're kind of blowing my mind with some of this stuff. I have. Oh, um, Hey, cool. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's see, my favorite is- thing about this show is I get to talk to so many people from so many perspectives and just kind of mentally mm-hmm. train in a sense and, and just. Well, yeah, you see, because um, like I keep saying, it's intent and it's your focus. You're, fo- you're, you're focused pretty hard on me. I can kind of tell that. It's interesting. Um, the, uh, you know, dealing with animals and kids, you have to know how to stay on their side. You don't want to freak them out. You don't want to scare them. That's the last thing you want to do. Um, you, you want to have them take the martial arts, the self-defense, all of this seriously. Don't fool around with it. Don't joke with it. It's not a joke. It's not a game. That said, let's go have some fun. And, and I, I watch and their job is to actually move me across. I say, yeah, pull me across the room. And then I stand there <laughs> and they are, they're having a blast trying to make me move. Mm. And I show them the difference between just standing there, standing there in stance, standing there with intent. And, and then I say, okay, I am going to walk across the room. I pull the belt over my shoulder and I take a step. 
squealing little kids. They're falling on their, on their behinds and trying hard to pull. And I take another step and I say, okay, hang on. I turn around and I say, okay, are you ready? And I let go and everybody falls all over the mats. Just trying to teach them how powerful it can be if they choose to do things properly. You know, they can wing, wing their arms around all over the place they want, but they won't have any effect. It's, it's a game like that or a game like Duck, Duck, Goose teaches um, safe competition and it starts to teach focus. So, so let's go have fun. Let's, let's play tag. Only every time that you, you are tagged, you have to go down and do, give me five pushups instead of, instead of um, freezing or going home, you know, do, do five pushups, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, one of the best games for the kids is when I had my friends in and we would do we, uh, a bunch of brown belts, bunch of black belts. And we all, we all did um, um, dodgeball. You'd start with all the white belts and all the kids in the in the there and all the brown belts and black belts with the dodgeballs. And every time you got hit, you had to drop out and do push-ups, right? And the idea is to clear the circle. Um, and then we swap places. The black belts and the brown belts go into the center and everybody else gets the ball. Uh, with the white belts, you only make them do like 10 push-ups or, you know, 20 push-ups. With, uh, with the black belts and brown belts, they should know better. They get to do 50 push-ups if they get hit. Um, but it's such a blast watching the, the white belts, yellow belts, green belts, and the kids and all. Just the idea that they can hit their teachers. And, and, they are, and they're supposed to is like all of a sudden game on, you know, it, it, it provides an incredible amount of focus because I'm going to get them. I'm going to get them, you know, that kind of thing. It's, it's an easy way to teach that kind of thing. I like it. I want to talk about your writing. Yeah. Because we've, we've, we've talked a little bit about it, but I, I've got a feeling that, the expression, you know, the, the art side of the martial art mm -hmm. that's surfacing for you now, mm -hmm. I don't think that suddenly popped up when you started training. Because if, if, I, if I heard the timetable right, you know, you didn't say when you were working on that novel, but it sounded like you were I've, an adult. I've been, I've been working as a professional writer since the 80s. Okay. So a, a, at least a little while, right? Uh, writing precedes martial arts for you. Is, yeah. is what I connected. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I tried to write my first book when I was like nine. So Okay. Yeah. Well, maybe not that book, but, but maybe. Yeah. Um, no. Um, so th the last we, two. Yeah. Where's that expression? Where's that expression of, of the compassion of heart, of self, of whatever you want to call it, that seems really solidly manifested hmm. in, in your own understanding of who you are and how that applies to your training and your instruction of martial arts? Where I, where was that in your writing? Uh, well, How did that show up? Let me put it this way: the latest, the last book I had out um, last year was is called Shadow of a Soul on Fire, and uh, only one person has has figured out where I stole that from. Um, but what we have in this particular book is. An evil, mad emperor wakes up in the wrong bed. He has been swapped in his sleep by the same guy from another world who happens to be the beloved, voted-in leader of the Republic. So we've got the emperor waking up in this totally strange bed. They're the same guy. They've been raised differently. And uh, the people in my republic are no fools. They figure out pretty damn fast that this is not their guy, even though he looks the same. Almost identical, not quite. But they lock him in the basement because he's so nuts, he's threatening to kill them all. 
there is one guy willing to talk to him, and that's the healer who is writing a book about nature versus nurture. How is this monster so different from our guy? They don't want to kill this guy because they're afraid that if they do, they'll never, that, that, that it's the hope of getting their own, their own beloved back somehow. They don't know. It doesn't seem like a good idea to them to kill the emperor. The whole book is him fighting them to not heal. Because he has been turned into a monster by dad. And my, dad's martial arts training was hellish for this guy. So the whole damn book is everyone trying to undo or trying to save the monster. How are monsters created? How are people driven crazy? And, uh, and, and crazy and uh, destructive, self-destructive, other destructive, all of this. And um, it's not until about page 120, 130, somewhere around there, that he actually grabs the bars of, the, of his cell and says to the healer, I don't want to heal. You you want me to grow a conscience? If I grew a conscience, I'd have to kill myself, and I don't want to die. The whole point of the book is him fighting him fighting with this idea of conscience, and you know he's a warrior, evil evil warrior emperor, you know. And uh, I've written two books in this world. It's a it's a one world is the is they went the the war went one way and they and they are um independent kingdoms voting people in the other world it's a it's oppressive evil empire you know um and uh uh one acknowledges two gods and one the empire acknowledges only god and calls all of the the women witches right but um, the two books written in there, um, the last one is Shadow of a Soul on Fire. And uh, I am actually developing a martial arts style of my own that I started in that book. And I'm calling it the Sword of Ink. Um, Musashi, when he was the sword saint of Japan, right? He was one hell of an artist drawing sumi paintings, sumi ink, ink drawings, right? He used to teach his students that if you could draw a perfect line, then you could draw your sword properly. And I'm taking that idea and running with it. If you can handle the ink, you have enough control, you have enough calm to be a good martial artist. Um, the first book I wrote in this series is in the Empire, and uh, it deals with the evil emperor's alcoholic younger brother, the only surviving brother that he's got, and he's um, supposedly a raging alcoholic. He's not, but Nobody knows that because uh, it's his. It's the only reason he is the um, only surviving brother of the emperor. He's not seen as a threat politically because he's a because he's a, a sloppy mouth drunk. Uh, so that one was called Sparks in the Wind, and uh, and uh, that one's available from WordPress actually. And uh, the Shadow of a Soul on Fire, uh, dealing with the monster, um, uh, is available, I believe, still on Amazon. So, oh, cool. uh, well, you yeah. you preempted my next question was where where we would find those. Ah, okay, um, yeah, I uh, I've I've been working on that one. I should be editing uh, a young my first young adult novel right now. Um, um, because I write children fairly well, 
Um, I'm told I do. Uh, I started out with uh, a 12 year old girl um, on a Greek island when Santorini blew up. And the book is called Lamia's Daughter. And how they deal with magic is entirely different than we do. So uh, the martial arts there is manifest only by the fact that there's this kid that shows up in a floating blue lotus and he says, call me Bodhi. Would you like a cup of tea? <laughs> anyway, he's, he's uh, the latest Bodhisattva, you see. And, uh, and he's just following my character around, offering her tea when she gets too upset. You know, that kind of thing. But um, I, um, I just want to point something out to the listeners, and, and, and this might warrant rewinding a little bit or a second listener, or, you know, if nothing more, just some, some consideration that as you've spoken about your writing, mm -hmm. you've spoken about that in a very similar, if not the same way that you've talked about your martial arts training and the way you've taught martial arts. In fact, you've talked about it the way almost everything we've talked about today has been with very similar uh, energy. Well, I and, it, and I'm I'm gonna I want I want to make a speculative comment before before you respond, if I may. Sure. And and this has been coming up for me a lot, which is which is kind of fun that I get I get a chance to uh, to bring it out here. This this notion that in in Chinese martial arts, when we talk about kung fu, mm -hmm. that the kung fu isn't a martial art it is mastery of a of a practice mm -hmm. yeah and i mentioned that's what jido, this is reminding jido, me. as opposed to godo yeah yeah well you see it's all intertwined my writing my art the martial arts shiatsu this is what feng shui is mm -hmm. to be honest it's a light it's a way of living and a way of looking at the world um because as you learn Hema, um, I mean, right now I'm, I'm with Bruce, I'm studying, he's teaching me longsword. I'm used to katana, so I have to retrain a lot of muscle memory. Um, uh, I have a heavy bag in the backyard, and he has a, a pell that he built out of old tires, and we're, we're going at it with wasters. Um, it's a lot of fun, but retraining muscle memory takes a lot of work. Writing and art and all of this stuff all takes work, work, time, effort. But the thing that every single one of them all takes is attention. And there we are back to intent. If I am writing, I am trying to tell you a story. Hey, look, see, see, look at, look at over there. I, I follow my characters around and write down what stupid stuff they do. Um, Look at this story. What if, uh, hey, if I drop paint on a canvas like this, what does it look like? Uh, if I poke you with the sharp end of this or the blunted end of this, did I get you? You know, it's all intent. It's all focus. It's all attention. Wow. You, you, can, you, can take, you can take the dullest of tasks. Not that I tend to. I tend to pick tasks that are a little bit more interesting to me. But you can still, if you can focus your 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 attention, you can get what artists and other and you know people, all kinds of people, sports, you know, they call the flow. Right. Martial arts, writing, art, you're you're always going for the flow. The moment when you transcend yourself. And if that's if that's in a dojo, I mean, the, there that there's the reason I think people don't realize that they are changed when they step into a dojo. Whether they continue on that path or they go someplace else, it's it's the act of choosing that that changes you and gives you at least an inkling that there is a way of transcending yourself. Well said. I guess, I guess, thank you. Um, yeah. Um, you see, an awful lot of people who start martial arts, they start karate, and then 
you know, it's like climbing a mountain. You take, you, you found a, a really good path up the mountain. You're going, you're going to, you know, go up there and you look over and you see this path over there and somebody else is doing something really cool. But people don't realize you can't just drop what you're doing and run over to that other path. What you have to do is go back down to the bottom of the mountain, find the start of that path and start up again. So a lot of people in new age and um, some yoga classes even, and, and all, you know, there's a lot of martial arts. They, um, they, first of all, they say my way or the highway, which is incorrect. And secondly, they say, uh, uh, don't pay attention to that guy behind the curtain. And they try to teach you their path. And you don't necessarily want to end up never having gotten to the top of the mountain because you kept running down and, get, and grabbing more shiny things into your, your magpie's nest of stuff, you know, ear candling and, and uh, oh, black hat feng shui and, and uh, hey, let's do this. Really, if you're going to learn martial arts of any kind, recognize that um, you, you, you are following a path up the mountain. Eventually, you're going to get to wherever and it won't be uh in an air-conditioned suv going straight along a highway like that it's a it's a very meandering walk hmm. and you'll find a heck of a lot of interesting stuff on the way if you take time to look at what you're walking on you told so, us about the the books mm -hmm. where else can people find you online uh, well i have a wiki page um under my name and um uh i do have a website but it is under construction it looks awful it's terrible um okay. i don't i don't recommend it at all um <laughs> well we will we won't link to it then but when it's done make sure you let us know and we will put it in the show notes I you know will. we can up to update those in the future yeah um yeah i mean it, it's it's so much it's so much fun as long as i'm i mean, I mean I, i'm I'm in it to have fun. Whether Isn't that the best reason? Yeah, because if I'm no longer having fun, why am I doing this? Hmm. Right? Sometimes it's even fun to get mad. But then, because of my training, I know very well how to put that down. Sure. So, um, oh, funny story for you. Yeah, Way please. back at the beginning of the um, of the uh, training, uh, I was saying it's Godo as opposed to Judo. Um, you know, you know, you know the basic difference there. Uh, maybe you want to explain to your readers what the difference is between Godo and Judo. I, I would, I would rather you do because the the okay. I I'm judo? not in a position to explain the concept. Okay, Judo, Judo is is the way of of, uh, of softness going with you know it's like it's 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 very soft and it is giving way it's it's uh godo is grab the guy by the lapels and drive him into the ground like a tent spike it's the way of strength Wham, bam. okay one of my teachers uh he was a young guy when i first met him uh, he, he was just a guest teacher, you know, and he said, oh, he had a chance to go across to Japan and he found a dojo so he could keep working out. He's a green belt at that point. So, you know, and dojos are like uh, in, in Japan, space is valuable. So it's on the rooftop and, you know, the door down at the bottom goes ting a ting a ting and you have to cl climb, you know, 87 flights of stairs to get up to the dojo. And he and his bunch of fellow judoka, at the time, they were learning judo, supposedly learning judo. They were uh, practicing a foot sweep. Now, what they were doing is kicking the other guy in the ankle, lifting him off the ground, and driving him into the t into the mat like a tent spike, you know. Hmm. And they're thinking they're doing it perfectly. This is a foot sweep. No, no. Anyway, they hear the door go ting ting ting, and uh, and they're going back and forth across the dojo. Whoa! Bam! Whoa! Bam, you know, having a great old time. And then they hear tick, tick, click, tick, tick, click. Somebody's climbing the stairs very oddly, they think. They see a, an elderly Japanese gentleman come up in, in the gi 
with his stick and he's so old he's doing one step at a time and then the, the cane so it's tip tip click and he's very slowly coming up the last stairs they can see his head kind of you know rising up over the floor as he as he climbs all the way up and uh, he puts his stick in the corner and he bows in and then he does he, he looks at what they're doing and he does the same motion but it's like he's doing flower arranging and they're laughing and they're the green belts and they're all and they're all going harder and harder and they don't notice that the this elderly gentleman has a white belt with two red stripes on it uh i don't know anything but if there's somebody that old who has a white belt with red stripes i pay very close attention to what that gentleman would, would tell me he didn't speak a lot of english but after a lot of the guys going wah bang wah bang you know go to um uh he comes over and he talks to one of the kids and says no 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 and he goes swoosh you know and everyone the the the, the green belts are all laughing and uh the old man says okay punch what i don't want to punch him i don't want to hurt him this could have been a movie you know it's a typical movie and and no no the guy uh gestures and uh this green belt throws out half speed guy puts his hands on his hips and glares at him and the guy says no no punch full speed and it's like okay so he gives him his best you know front punch just just straight going to drive him in the ch in the chest the guy goes whoosh and the kid lands on his back. All he did was swoosh, you know, just, just, he did the foot sweep properly. It was like, it was like a uh, wind motion, just whoosh, bang. A uh, kid climbs to his feet, dusts himself off, bows to the master, and they start walking by themselves back and forth across the, across the dojo wing, swish, 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 <laughs> learning how to be soft because they saw the punch and the threat just waft, bang. It was a beautiful moment, he said. They learned an awful lot about the difference between judo and godo from one move. I thought that was funny as hell. Anyway, I like still there? I'm still here. Yeah. No, I'm I'm hanging on. This is this has been great. Okay, and I appreciate um, you you coming on. That's a phenomenal story to that's to cool. kind of end on there. Okay, uh, someday I'll have to tell you about one of my students who found out that she could use her electric wheelchair as an effective <laughs> weapon. Okay, well you can't you can't leave us with a cliffhanger like that. Oh sure, I can. <laughs> oh, I got lots okay. of them. Anyway, no, um, differently abled lady who had control of like one hand, one finger on one hand and she could drive an electric wheelchair. And uh, this lady is the one, the strong-willed woman. She had been assaulted by an attendant who put the attendant sign up and no matter what noise she made, nobody checked. So she arranged uh, this self-defense class. And we found out, uh, I, got a, I got a friend of mine actually uh, to help me out because I'm not six foot three, I'm, I'm you know, five foot four. Um, but she found out that if she was willing to treat her wheelchair, her electric wheelchair, like a, like a weapon, she could chase anyone trying to hurt her around the dojo. She, she, could, she could literally gain control of the situation if she was willing to use her wheelchair as a weapon. You see, I don't care how big you are. My, my, my assistant was saying, you know, it's, it's, I'm trying to get her out of the chair and she's driving at me with this thing. And there's something that kicks in your hind brain. I don't care how enraged you are. It says big thing about to hit you, run you over and you back up. And, uh, the lady, uh, had her best afternoon laughing her ass off chasing us around the dojo with her chair. So she learned a little bit more freedom that day. Fantastic.
Yeah. And that's now you've fun. been, go ahead. No, I said, isn't that fun? It, it is fun. It yeah. is fun. And it adds some levity to uh, an experience that I think most people would look at and say, you know, that there's, there's nothing positive there. There's no advantage. There's nothing that can be done. And, um, and she, she said, like hell, nobody's going to, I'm going to find someone to teach me how to defend myself. Even if mm. all, all the only control I have is one hand. Yeah. That's great. Um, That's great. Did, well, did, did TJ not t- tell you his, um, his uh, uh, differently abled students story? I don't think he did. Oh. I don't recall that. Uh, there was a, there was a time when uh, people were actually assaulting handicapped people in New York. Um, the cops had a name for it. It's quite, it's, I don't like it. They called it crip bashing because people who beat up other people are not looking for a fight. They're looking for a target, right? right. So Steve had multiple sclerosis and walked with a couple of canes. He really only had one move if he was in his chair. Um, it's a palm heel. And the and the, the the strike is straightforward. It's like it's like a, a front punch, but with palm heel. That's all he could do, really. Um, there's this guy who grabs him, grabs the arms of his chair, and is screaming at him what he's going to do to him. Now, Steve at that point had, sorry, I, the student, at that point had, uh, let's just say he had a lot of motivation. Everything he had went into the one strike, hit the guy in the middle of the sternum so hard that the guy somersaulted backwards, got up, looked at this guy in a wheelchair, thinking, shit, if he could do that, and he ran. So it was motivation and intent saved him. Saved him. Hmm. Yeah. And it was, and he's laughing. He's laughing because he couldn't do anything else. But the, that guy didn't know it. You know, that's yeah. that's self-defense, I'd say. I, I would completely agree. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's one of my favorite stories just because um, I, I like collecting stories of people successfully defending themselves. They do end up in stories and books when I'm working on them, too. So. Well, we, we've we've got a bit of a library here. If you if you want a reference, lovely. Thank quite you. a few quite a few episodes have have had people talking about their own experiences, cool. and I appreciate you talking about yours today. This has been an absolutely wonderful conversation and one that I'm cool. glad we had. I appreciate Thank you. you coming on. Yeah, yeah ni- nice nice to talk to you. I'm really glad. It's nice to talk to you too. Mm-hmm. And we've got one more thing before yes. we we send it out and into the outro that I will record later. Okay. And that is, how do you want to end this? You know, most guests have some kind of parting words or some final thought, something, something that, uh, I mean, and it, it's really run the gamut. It can be simple. It can be complex. Well, but no, how, how, how about, would you want to choose to end this? Um, have fun learning to do the good stuff. And it's all the good stuff. Wonderful. Yeah. Hey, I can let you know what uh, what's happening with Chloe and I, the horse and I. You know, um, uh, I am only now getting to the point where I can actually consider doing uh, the archery with the riding. So, as I told you in the intro, this one kind of wandered, and I know on a lot of shows that wandering is seen as a bad thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. I appreciate the wandering. I appreciate the variety of the guests, the conversation, the stories that we bring you on this show. And I think that was pretty well exhibited in this episode. So, Ms. Meyer, thank you so much for your time for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate it. And I enjoyed myself. I hope you did as well. If you want the show notes with photos and links and all that good stuff, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Every episode has a page of its own over there. Makes it easy to find what you're looking for. Don't forget that search function if you're looking for something in particular. With this many episodes, it's kind of hard to have a subject that we haven't talked about at some point. 
If all these things that we do warrant your support, well, there are a number of things you can do. You can visit the store at whistlekick.com and use the code PODCAST15 to get 15% off, or leave a review, buy a book or a program, help out with the Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick, follow us on social media, it's all over the place. Anything that you do to help us is greatly appreciated, and I truly, truly appreciate all of you who have done so many things to help up until now, and those who help into the future. We couldn't do it without you. And remember, if you see somebody out there wearing something with Whistlekick on it, say hello, introduce yourself, and maybe you'll make a new friend or training partner. If you have a guest suggestion, I want to hear about those. Email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And that's it for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day. 